Kia ora everybody and welcome to my talk, Design Fundamentals for Doll Artists. All good design is guided by the core values of fundamental design principles and doll design is no exception. Getting the foundations right within the core structure of your doll design is key, so all additional design decisions enhance the whole. This talk is a culmination of design principles that I'm familiar with through my role as a university lecturer across a diverse array of design subjects from concept design to illustration, visual communication design, product and textiles, and the common themes that arise from all of these disciplines. In this talk, I'll walk you through what I believe are the core design fundamentals for doll artists. These core fundamentals will help you to analyze your design decisions as you are developing your doll and to think more critically about the choices that you make. It will also hopefully help emerging designers understand design fundamentals so they can get their design foundations worked out before they get too far into the details. Doll design is an interdisciplinary endeavour, with doll designers needing to wear many hats. It's a lot to master, so hopefully this guide will help you as you wear many design hats in your design process. I'm going to start with a mode of universally known design principles that we teach within our program, known as the Gestalt Principles. This is a cognitive psychology principle defined in the early 20th century to explain how humans see and respond to objects and environments around them. Gestalt in German means form, pattern or configuration. Gestalt psychologists emphasise that we perceive entire patterns or configurations, not merely as individual components. Gestalt design principles are commonly summed up by the phrase, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. The Gestalt principles are similarity, continuation, closure, proximity, figure ground, symmetry and order. Similarity explores a form of visual hierarchy viewers see the individual elements as a group that feel visually right as a keys of pattern. For a doll, this could be the repeated use of similar colours or shapes within the design to accentuate a design idea. Continuation is where the eye is drawn along a path through the design, so we can read the whole design as a continuous figure. In animation, we call this the line of action, and for a doll designer, this could be the fluid line through the spine of the doll from the head to the feet. Closure describes the need for us to see complete shapes, or the use of negative space, to complete a shape. Proximity looks at the relationship between groups of objects within the whole. This can be relevant to scale, shape, colour, or other qualities. For doll makers, this is often about patterns and detailing. Figure ground is the eye's tendency to see and separate objects from their surrounding background. In character design, this is referred to as defining the silhouette. And lastly, symmetry and order, that elements that are symmetrical to each other tend to be see perceived as a unified group. My intention is that if you use these design principles within your doll design approach, your design will feel more visually and structurally coherent. So how is this relevant to dolls? And what are some useful tools that I can use to make my doll ideas come to fruition? Some aspects of the Gestalt principles are easily seen within the doll design process, and others are a bit more complicated or need to be explored further. So to help with the doll design process, I've made this guide, which is a hybrid of the Gestalt principles and other design principles used within character design, which is directly related to doll design. I've grouped these principles under three categories, structure, character and details. You need to get the doll structure right first in combination with consideration of character. Once these foundations are in place, you can focus on the details. The structure principles generally come first, but you'll need to keep revisiting your decisions as you work through the steps to ensure everything still works for the design. Each section is as important as each other. Here is a quick overview of the 12 steps in the design fundamentals for doll artists. Under structure, we start with anatomy, which is a literal understanding of the bone and muscle structure of the doll. This is also relevant for more abstract dolls, but is more easily summed up in the second principle silhouette, which explores the overall shape of the doll against the negative space of the background. Next comes pose, which looks at the dynamic line of action, movement and dynamism of the doll. This is combined with balance, which looks at the symmetry and asymmetry of the figure and considers the balance of not just the doll, but its relationship to its base and its props. 
In the next category, we start with culture. What is the culture of your doll? Where are ideas coming from? Are they inspired by a person, peoples, myth or legend, or a natural force? Collectively, this is all considered the cultural consideration of the doll design. The next principle is much more intimate to the core of the doll. Expression focuses on the personality, story and emotion of the doll. This is not limited to the face and is influenced heavily by decisions made at the structural phase. Next is visual hierarchy, which forces the designer to choose the order of importance each design element has. Does it need to have wings and a tail and an elaborate dress? What is most important and how do you choose? The last in this category is emphasis, which is establishing a focal point within the design. The last category looks at details such as colour and textuality. Colour looks at colour theory, what colours mean and which colours work together. Textuality considers the materials that we use, natural or synthetic fibres and fabrics, found objects or bespoke items. Lastly, unity and harmony look at the alignment and rhythm in the form of patterns and details, and contrast looks at how colours and patterns are used together and the visual relationship this forms. In the next part of the talk, I'll describe each step in detail. Before I move on to the steps, I want to talk a little bit about the design process. I find making dolls can be often a case of two steps forwards and one back. As much as I like to plan my designs, there is always an aspect of play and experimentation where I just try things out and see if that works. However, there are a few techniques you can use in the planning process as you move through the fundamental steps. The first is to make drawings. I'm not talking about full illustrative sketches of your designs, but small thumbnails and shape studies to test proportion and shape of your design potential before you get into working with expensive materials. The drawings can be rough, but in making a drawing, you have something that you can plan from, even if it's just a guide for how tall your armature needs to be. The next tip to get started is to collect a magpie board of inspiration for your design. This shouldn't just be reference images of dolls, but a wider collection of things that you find inspirational. It could be other toys, collectibles, found natural items, fabric samples, cultural, ecological or technological inspiration. It could be anything. I recommend printing this out or putting your collage together on a pin board so that while you are designing you can see all of your inspirations. That way your mind will pick up pieces of your inspirations and this helps you to generate something unique and new that isn't just a representation of one thing that already exists. To explain the doll design fundamentals to you, I'm going to use examples from my lovely peers at Miata. In the examples I will show, be aware that these are my assumptions based on a design reading of the pieces. A successful design should be able to be read by anyone, irrelevant to whether the doll artist is there to explain it or not. Your dolls should stand on their own, and the dolls I've chosen all speak for themselves through successful design principles. Some of my propositions are also based on knowing the artists and their process, so you can see design principles read across a wider body of their work, and also within the individual pieces. Okay, let's get started. We will start with structure. This is the core shape and form of your doll. You need to get this right before you add any details as it's the first way that we read your design. Our eye wants to read a solid shape and if the overall form is not interesting to us, it will be harder for us to engage with the details. This is also where you resolve any fundamental anatomical issues. Lisa Lichtenfels literally builds a skeleton for her dolls. As her dolls are based on real human proportions, it's crucial she gets the skeleton accurate as it can be very difficult to adjust once the fabric layers have been added. As she is working off known skeleton dimensions, she can measure off skeleton photos or off drawings to ensure that each bone is the right dimension. If you're working in realism, make sure you use calipers or rulers to measure off your reference and check your dimensions, as you'll be amazed at how much doing it by eye it enables you to cheat. Anatomy is not just relevant to realism, even abstract characters have a sense of anatomy. Under the skin we can still imagine what the skeleton might look like and how the muscle fits to each bone. Anna Salvador works on child proportions and then exaggerates the head to make it larger in comparison to the body in order to enhance the childlike qualities. But as these are ball-jointed dolls, 
the proportions of each limb to the body still needs to have relative scale and function. Anatomy is not a static thing, and if you're making your doll's limb, limbs longer or shorter than is normal, it's important that you see what they look like when they're bent as well as straight, to ensure that that still works visually. You might also want to show the anatomy in action. Within the Doll August, automata doll designers Chomik and Mida show us how the doll moves with the automata gears corresponding to muscle movements of their doll, showing us the anatomy in action. Next is Silhouette. This is one of the fundamentals of character design shape language, and from Disney to dolls, it's an easy way to see if the overall shape of your doll design is distinctive, iconic, or just reads clearly as a figurative form. One of the easiest ways to check silhouette is to take a photograph and print it out. Um, then if you colour in the doll, this will reveal the silhouette. In this instance, I've traced Emma's doll in Photoshop to reveal the silhouette. There is a lovely sense of dynamic movement through this figure that enables your eyes to flow through the design from the head to the toe and read that it is a seated figure. The curve of her back shows a sense of burden which is further defined by the large headdress that she bears. Negative windows help us to define her neck as separate to her headdress and the slenderness of her arms. Without these windows, the figure would look very bulky and lose the litheness that is evident within the design. In these doll examples by Sandra Oglesby and Juliet Paluk, we see a strong silhouette but also consideration of strong shape language. Shapes such as circles, squares and triangles all have meaning much the same as colours. Sandra's doll has a very square shape which invokes feelings of strength, sturdiness and reliability, whereas Juliet's doll is very triangular, which reflects emotions of dynamism, danger and changeability. And here are the dolls. The next fundamental is pose, and specifically what we refer to as the line of action within the design. The line of action is an imaginary line along the spine that describes the movement of the doll and implies an invisible force that animates the figure to bring it to life. It is not dissimilar to pulling on a marionette in order to get it to move. The line of action is fluid and pulls everything attached along with it. Wind by Ema is a perfect example of line of action. You can see the impact of the wind trying to push the doll off her feet and her glee in pushing it back to stay upright. Here I have drawn the primary line of action that starts with the doll's hair, travels through her torso and weight-bearing leg to the tip of her toe. There is a secondary line which helps to show the sheer force the doll is under. This one travels from fingertip to outstretched leg. The acuteness of where both lines almost joined contrasted with the further spread shows just how much force pressure she is under to create such a powerful dynamic pose within the doll that feels at the same time both destabilizing and also really balanced. Line of action can also help us to define an open or closed pose within the doll design. In these examples, Anna's doll has, been, has a very open line of action with her pelvis forwards and head parallel with her feet. The doll is friendly and appealing. Her prop carried across her front, however, gives her open pose a sense of power and strength, with her, her stance firmly planted on both feet. In the example by Stephanie Blythe, both figures lean into each other to a point where their action lines run in parallel, making for a close and very intimate pose. The extended leg of the male figure further accentuates the power shift as the two figures literally merge into each other. This brings us to balance. Balance defines the central line of the doll, also known as the gravity line. If your doll is tipping over, chances are the weight is not even on the central line. This doesn't mean you need to resort to a base or make your doll stand stiff on two legs. You just need to consider where the weight is. Generally, if it works physically, it should work visually, but this does not always make for an interesting pose. Enter contraposto, which is Ital in Italian means counterpose. This is where we place the weight of the figure onto one foot so the arms and shoulders can twist offset from the legs and hips, 
and still maintain a more relaxed, balanced pose. A great example of this is by Forrest Rogers. The twist of the torso enables weight to be evenly distributed on both sides, but makes the pose feel more dynamic and gestural. We can also invoke balance through visual composition, through a contrast between a lot of larger and smaller shapes. This is especially relevant when you need to consider both the doll and the props. Although in the example by Neva Wald, Leo has equal body shape in front and behind the central line, a bulk of the weight is at the top, which makes the figure feel like he's falling backwards, even with his foot kicked out for support. The addition of the alligator at the base as a counterbalance helps to visually even up the figure distribution on either side of the center line, and this is what we would regard as an asymmetrical balance. In Connie's example, the design grows visually from the base up. This is enhanced by having a narrow tree and simple dressing on the doll's legs, so the shape can blossom out as a large shape in contrast to the bottom. The weight distribution is equal on both sides of the center line, which means this is a symmetrical balance. This example by Forrest Rogers shows an extreme example of counterbalance. She uses the shapes within the base as a weight, both visually and physically, to anchor the figure. The curved back of the doll's arm and the raven also add to even the weight distribution. Our next section talks about character. This is where we look at the story and the personality of the doll and how we tell these stories through the overall shape and the tone of the doll. It's also about props and detail. We will start with culture. It could be a specific cultural story that you want to tell within your work, or this could be the culture that you create around your doll. Our first example is Lisa Lichtenfeld's doll, Elephant Polo. Lisa has a great sense of humour and brings a satirical perspective to the story of this doll. The figure is based on a Japanese girl, Kasumi, and her polo club, the Scurry Tuskers. Lisa researched her subject extensively and spun out the story within her sculpt. She muses on her website, I have to wonder what all those thoughtful elephants in India and Thailand think when hordes of the super rich show up once a year to ride them around a field tapping balls with long sticks. Developing a doll's culture can also mean expanding on reality in order to tell a good story. My Doll, the Moose of Fiordland, is a homage to pioneering conservationist Richard Henry, who established the world's first predator-free island reserve for kakapo birds in the wilds of Fiordland. A small population of moose has since also been released into Fiordland, never to be seen again. Both Richard and the moose were introduced species and both had diverse effects on the ecosystem they worked within. In this doll, I wanted to metaphorically represent Richard as a cryptid, a one-of-a-kind creature and product of its ecosystem. This enabled me to give Richard self-sacrifice in the aid of conservation and environment a more mythical and spiritual connotation. A doll's culture can also serve to document history. Mary Ellen Frank is well known for her wooden portrait dolls of indigenous peoples. This doll is a portrait of Lena Ati, a Yupik expert in the traditional craft of grass weaving that she uses to make garments and other objects. She in turn taught her daughter and the community to weave. Mary Ellen uses materials and techniques as authentic to real life as possible within her work to enable a genuine and accurate perspective of the life of her characters. Mary Ellen says of her work, you can see so much of about a culture from looking at these dolls. This is the way to keep these stories alive for generations to come. Dolls themselves are embodied beings, and I believe we always leave a bit of our soul in every design that we make. This manifests in their expression and personality. Emma's doll is one of my favourites and represents childhood. The contented expression on both the cat and the little girl's face speak of days in the sun and daydreaming. The scale of the cat and its representation as both the childhood companion and the backdrop for the imaginative daydreams further supports the nostalgia of childhood. Donna Mae Robinson collects photos of expressions that she can use in her dolls. She uses the expressions to influence her face painting and to tell her what the doll personality is going to be. Expressions can be much more subtle and can give an enigmatic expression to the doll within the whole body. The wistful expression of Nina's doll Autumn draws the viewer into his world as he casually rests, his body relaxed, and smokes a cigarette lost in thought. We contemplate what he's thinking. Anna's doll, in contrast, is upright with a strong posture. She stares at us with a determined intensity and her face firmly set towards her objectives. 
It's complicated enough to design a doll itself, and then there is the base to consider as well. They both need to work as a cohesive design. Visual hierarchy looks at the order of importance of each of your items and how to balance your design without it becoming cluttered. Anna uses a gradient of colours from dark at the bottom to light at the top. Your eye moves naturally from dark to light, so you are drawn to the doll's face. The flowers in the base further exaggerate this, by the flowers curving on their stems to point towards the doll face, but none of the flowers cross over her body, so the design has space to breathe. Cindy Moyer uses the pose of the doll's body, alignment of the arms, and the doll's eye line to draw your eye to the focal point of the birdcage. She also uses a colour gradient from dark to light to draw the eye up the figure to the face in the cage. Using props is another good way to show character, but you again need to adhere to a hierarchical structure to ensure you don't clutter the design. In this example, inspired by the Alice in Wonderland chapter Pig and Pepper, key supporting character the baby piglet is represented as a discrete element at the doll's side. The blue china hat on the piglet is repeated in the Duchess's hair, which ties these two elements together within the story a moment where the Wonderland characters smash the crockery. The Duchess's spoon is kept close to her person, as this was used to spoon pepper and as the catalyst for the whole chapter. Colour is a clever way to create a focal point, and in these examples red is used to tell the key character story components. In Elizabeth's doll, red is used to highlight her decadent indulgences, shoes, lipstick, nail polish and necklace as a colour focus. Her emotional response to this decadence is reflected in her cheek blush. Marlene uses red in a similar way for both the captive heart of her princess and the game she plays in boredom while she waits. Emphasis can be used within subtle details that give a singular perspective of the doll's expression. Catherine Mather Celeste touches her lip in a coy, seductive manner. Susan's party animals appear to have gotten a little bit too wild, and the little boy at the front turns to the viewer to ask quietly if he can leave the table. Our next section looks at the fundamental use of colour within doll making. Colours come loaded with meaning, both symbolically and culturally. It's another form of shorthanding your design intent, so the viewer understands your doll design. The three primary colours mix to make secondary colours, and again to make tertiary. Colours form meaning relationships between each other based on where they are in the colour wheel. Shades are where the colours become darker to black, and tints are where colours move closer to pastel and white. A tone is when you add grey. Catherine's doll uses a split complementary colour palette in pastel, which means the turquoise, pink and gold tints are triadic, being tints of the primary colours. The colours blue and pink refer to peace and passion, with yellow as optimism, which alludes to the romantic tones common within the Art Nouveau movement of which this doll is inspired. Tatiana's dolls often feature a very subdued palette, reflective of the natural fibres she uses within her dolls. This doll works in a tonal range from black to cream, with colour symbolism referencing elegance and calm. Leslie is very conscious of the use of colour within her designs, as each of her pieces is deeply symbolic of the themes and cultures they represent. For the lotus flower, she has used an analogous palette, with the key colours orange, yellow and green all next to each other on the colour wheel. Analogous palettes feel complete, as the colours all support each other, and in this colour choice they also symbolically line up too, meaning nature, warmth and happiness. The next principle is contrast. I've mentioned contrast earlier in reference to silhouette, but this is more of a nuanced look at creating contrast within the figure itself. The first method is through colour contrast. Anna's dolls are muses of the light and dark, so accordingly, their headdresses are both black and white. The choice not to use these colours within the costumes as well makes the focus of the contrast in the headdresses more defined. Contrast can also be shown through textures, which Shelley is exceptionally good at balancing within her dolls. There is a misconception that you should never put patterns with patterns, but contrast can still be made, even when both patterns are detailed. Shelley creates contrast using complementary colour systems within the patterns. The colours work together and their differences enable the pattern to retain its own space within the design. This creates a bold visual style that is visually coherent. The fundamentals of unity and harmony look at how all elements work together 
to make visual rhythm and flow. This includes all elements at once, silhouette, pose, line of action, expression, colour, texture and movement. Both examples use the same relaxed and confident pose, with the doll engaging confidently straight ahead with the user and a strong line of action. The use of colour is restrained and uses tints, tones and shades to add definition. This creates an overall visual harmony where the doll feels as a whole very cohesive. This visual harmony is also defined within Dustin's Cinderella, starting with a strong silhouette and pose, storytelling and clearly defined visual hierarchy, his restraint with colour and tonal embellishment frames the face and shoes to make this a strikingly rhythmic piece. We are now at the last of the 12 fundamental design principles, textuality. This should arguably be considered at the beginning, but doll makers often explore textuality within the costume rather than the doll itself. However, depending on the medium, you might want to look at this one earlier. If you're working in wood, the grain of the timber carries its own expression, and in this piece by Larry Blount, his chosen timber that reveals faces and costumes within the timber rather than making this an additive detail. Diane uses sumptuous materials, velvet and fur together, to give the costume a richness, and although both fabrics are very textural, the scale of the fur against the velvet creates the contrast the design needs to not feel overwhelmed. She has used minimal embellishments to further balance with the sumptuousness of the material. But detail is our jam, and many doll makers are also talented embroiderers and beaders. We love to add embellishment to our designs. These two examples by Leslie and Teresa show the extent you can go to with detailing while still retaining a consistency of design. Again, they manage to balance the busyness by contrasting detailed patterns with plain, or using complementary colour systems to enable busyness without clutter. Careful consideration has been given to the scale of the patterns and consistent fibres and material choices so they fit with the scale of the doll and they don't dominate. Hopefully this has given you a bit of an insight into the design decisions you can make to make better choices within your doll work, and this can be a helpful tool to refer back to. You might find this process inspiring, or it might be a bit intimidating, and in the back of the mind you might be thinking, what if I get this wrong? My key bit of takeaway advice is that no matter how far through a design you are, if it is not working at a fundamental level, you need to change it. Otherwise, this will have a knock-on effect to the next steps of your design, and you may be unable to resolve the issues. It doesn't matter how much experience you've had, we all get it wrong sometimes. The key is knowing what to look for, so we can fix it. This is one of my favourite dolls of unicorns and virgins, but the doll on the right was the first iteration. I was trying something new with the hair, and it just never worked for me. Even after exhibiting the doll, I knew I needed to take her back to the fundamentals. Now I'm here everyone, thanks for coming to my talk and please feel free to post any questions in the Facebook chat. Bye.